Good evening, everyone. My name is Katie Zontak, and I'm the Cultural Arts Director at the JCC in Buffalo, New York. I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's event, which is our kickoff event for the Jewish Poetry Reading Series presented by the JCC. The Cultural Arts Department at the JCC in Buffalo supports two art galleries and presents an annual book and arts fair and a film festival. Additionally, we offer cultural arts programs such as concerts, family programs, adult discussion groups, and workshops throughout the year that showcase Jewish culture. I'm excited to have the opportunity to now include this wonderful Jewish poetry reading series in our programming and would like to give a special thanks to Philip Terman and Baruch November for all their efforts and the volunteer work that they've done to help put this wonderful evening and the rest of our series together. Tonight's event will feature contributors from the just released anthology, 101 Jewish Poems for the Third Millennium. Before I turn it over to Philip and Baruch, who will be hosting the event, I'd like to remind everyone that's participating and viewing on YouTube that you can submit questions through the chat, and please do so uh, at any time during the event. We'll conclude uh, after the reading, we'll conclude the event with a Q&A, and we'll try our best to get to all the questions that you submit. So now I'm going to uh, sign myself off and enjoy the evening with the rest of you. Thank you again for participating. And I turn it over to Philip and Baruch. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for joining us for this really wonderful, wonderful event featuring poets in the wonderful anthology, 101 Jewish Poems for the Third Millennium, which looks like this. And we have a, a really great helping of poets uh, from from the anthology reading tonight. Um, and uh, just want to let you know, this is our second uh, Jewish poetry series event. Uh, our first in, um, featured Eleanor Wilner, Alicia Allstriker, and Yehoshua November. And we have some coming up that we'll talk about later. Uh, but we're really excited to uh, start off the year with, uh, with these wonderful poets from the anthology. Um, we're going to start by just asking the obvious question of of the editors. Um, perhaps I should uh, introduce the editors first <laughs> and the publisher. I'll introduce the first editor uh, that I have on my list, Nancy Naomi Carlson. Uh, she is uh, a well-published poet and translator, a two-time recipient of an NEA Literature Translation Fellowships. She's authored most recently, uh, An Infusion of Violets, which we could all use right now, from Seagull Press. Um, and it was named a new and noteworthy book by the New York Times. And she's published many other books that you can find on her website. And I highly recommend you checking that out um, as well. And uh, maybe Baruch wants to say a few words. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here with you tonight and to introduce uh, another editor, Matthew Silverman, who is the former editor of the Blue Lyra Review. He has authored the floating uh, of his own, his own poetry collect collections, the floating door and the breath before birds fly. He's also the co-editor of two other Jewish anthologies and his poems have appeared in over 80 journals. I'd also like to uh, introduce uh, the publisher, Jennifer Rathbun. She's a, a poet and translator. She's a professor of Spanish and associate editor of Ashland Poetry Press at Ashland University. She is the translator of 10 books by Hispanic authors, including Alberto Blanco and Minerva Margarita Villarreal. So, yeah. Wow. So we have some um, already some incredible poets and translators and anthologists. Uh, speaking of anthologies, let's get right to this particular anthology and ask um, whoever wants to uh, take up the question of tell the story of this anthology. Talk a little bit about um, what your thoughts were, where it came from, and where it went. Maybe I can start Nancy? with it. Yes. Sure. Uh, it wasn't my idea. <laughs> it was Matthew's, and Matthew said, "Hey, I'm I'm thinking of doing a Jewish anthology, an, another one, and um, I thought it would be great if if we could co-edit it together." And I'd never co-edited or edited an anthology, but I thought, you know, if, if you're going to do something for the first time, if you have someone who can show you the way along the path, it's a lot easier. 
And so I, I said, sure, that sounds good. What do we do? When do we get started? And uh, we put out a call for Jewish themed poems. Um, and we got 800 poems sent to us. And we thought, wow, this is something that people have an interest in. But that also meant we had to go and go through all 800 of them. Um, and it took us quite a while to do that and talk between ourselves about that. But then the, the hardest thing was finding a publisher because that was not under our control. It was under our control to go through the poems and use our judgment and choose, but finding a publisher. So we sent out emails to several publishers and there was some talk about if um, some publishers said everyone that we spoke to in person said, oh, we'd love to publish it, but money was an object too. So that, that came into play, but we sent to a wide variety of folks and then maybe a couple of weeks into it because people were reacting and saying, hey, this is interesting. I don't know if we can do it. Maybe we could. Um, I got a phone call from Jen at Ashland Poetry Press and she said, we want this. This is, this is amazing. We would love the idea. We want to publish it. And then she listed, but you have to be okay with this, this, and this, and this. And I was expecting she was going to say something that I might not be okay with. Um, and for the most part, everything she said, I was okay with. And Matthew was excited. And then the rest is history. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Matthew to add in to that story. I don't know what I could add to it. That was very thorough. Um, but I do want to thank the press for uh, taking it up. Uh, it's, I think the more Jewish poetry we have in the world, the better, um, especially in a time when anti-Semitism has been on the rise in the last five years. And um, I'm grateful that Ashland uh, Press has, has noticed that and uh, published all these great poets in there as well. So, so thank you. Let me ask a follow-up question. <laughs> um, what was your concept? Did you have some thoughts about representation, inclusion? Um, you know, you have 800 poems. You know, could you possibly give us a sense of why these poems? You know? we, want, we wanted poems that focused on uh, Jewish themes in the um, new century, you know, and that were written about the new century and for the most part were unpublished. So they were, they were new and, and fresh. And we wanted a variety of poems from um, international folks, from people on the West Coast of America, on the East Coast, uh, people who were devoutly believing in Judaism, um, people who were atheist Jews. We wanted people who were not Jewish at all, you know, and we wanted a real thorough uh, mix uh, to just uh, talk about. And that's how that we, um, Wanted to, wanted to make sure that, that the poems honor that um, and just talk about different things that happened so that if someone read the whole anthology, they would realize what every single uh, Jewish person realizes that, um, you know, Jews are regular people with, uh, you know, common uh, things for everybody else. And that's how we came up with it. Did you want to add to that, Nancy? I, I, I thought that was well stated. Um, we could get into the question about what we wanted to do with poems about Palestine and Israel. Um, that was an interesting discussion. But I wanted to go back, if I may, and go back to, to Jen for her view of the history of it, because we know what we saw, but it would be interesting for us to hear what she saw when we, she got that initial email from us, if that's okay. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me this evening. It's an honor and pleasure to, to be, with he, be with you here and to share this space. And actually, Nancy, this is a conversation that uh, Matthew, Nancy, and I have never had. You know, what happened on our end? And I will tell you in preparation for tonight, I just did a little bit of digging in my emails. And the, the first email that I received from the Ashland Poetry Press email account that got forwarded to mine was on April 22nd, 2019. So we're talking about it's hasn't even been two years and now we have the, the 
product in our hand. Um, no small uh, miracle within itself, um, especially given the, the COVID days. And um, on Tuesday, April 23rd, I saw that I had some correspondence. Um, I'm the associate editor. I'd corresponded with the editor. And she had been involved in the press for several, several years. We've been around for 50 years. And we had done a series of anthologies in the past. We did, um, I believe, 70s on the 7, 80s on the 8. Um, so anthologies that were generational um, based on the, the decades. But we hadn't done an anthology in many years. And our editor didn't really want to take on the, the mantle of this project. And I was reading our correspondence back and forth. And I said, but I do. But I want it. And she said, well, Jennifer, will you take this project on on your own? And I said, absolutely, yes. I wanted to run with it. Um, in my past, I have actually edited a couple of anthologies and I'd had great success with them and thoroughly enjoyed the process. And I know how enriching anthologies can be and how they help spread the accessibility of poetry and also that I felt like it was an important message. 2018, I mean, it's 2021 now, we're breathing a little bit different air, we're starting to come out of a, a really dark era. but as you well know, we did suffer under the last presidency and we did see um, anti-Semitism on the rise. And I am a DEI ally and champion and I am always interested in advancing diverse voices. So what I saw in the anthology that made me just wanna jump on it was this rich diversity. That, that spoke not only to your question here of you know, what is a Jewish poem or how did you select the Jewish poems, but it spoke to humanity and, and how as humans, we have this moral obligation to one another and um, how we can move forward as better humans through poetry. And that's why I jumped on it. And actually to you know, rob a line from a, a movie, I'd say they had me at hello. Uh, my background is um, in Latin American literature, and if you're holding the anthology in your hand, you know the very first poet here is a Chilean poet. And so that's the first one that captured my attention. I love the rich diversity, how there were voices from all over the world and in translation. And I knew that we just couldn't pass on the project. It's been very well received, um, receiving all the attention it so rightfully deserves. I, I thank you for that question. Thanks. Well, shall we get started? Baruch, any, any other? <laughs> Sounds good to me. Let's. I'd want to hear some poetry. Let's kick it off. Nancy or Matthew? <laughs> I think it's Matthew. Yeah, I think, I think that's me. I'm going to um, uh, introduce the first poet. Before I do, I just want to take a, a smidgen of time to really thank the, uh, the Buffalo JCC for um, having this event today, and of course for Philip Terman, who is amazing in so many ways and a great person, and Baroque November uh, as well too for hosting it. So we uh, we appreciate it, and of course for all the poets for their wonderful um, words who contributed. Uh, obviously, there wouldn't be an anthology without um, y'all involved in it, and of course to the um, amazing audience who is tuning in right now to to hear poetry. Um, after 2020, we need all the poetry we, we can get. So without further ado, I, I would like to introduce uh, the first poet to read, and that's uh, Jane Yolen, who has an amazing 400 books out and well-deserved, um, just great stuff. Uh, and she's actually coming out with five more books uh, and not slowing down um, at all in here. Um, at 82, she's uh, not slowing down. In fact, she recently was uh, remarried after uh, 15 years, a widow and uh, a great poet. Um, and without further ado, let me introduce Jane Yolen. Jane, you have to still unmute yourself, Jane.
There you go. Now? Good. Um, the poem I'm going to read is a, a true story that happened to me, and it's called Shoes, Holocaust Museum, Washington, D.C. I walk with foreknowledge into the museum, sure it has nothing to teach me. I've read the biographies, watched the movies, sat through Shoah three times, Schindler's List. I've touched a weeping stone in Heidelberg for a synagogue set alight by hate. I've interviewed survivors, dated a survivor's child, did the research, listened to a friend retell his childhood in a Polish labor camp, forced to dive into the midden whenever the commandant's car drove by. So why now, standing by a pyramid of shoes from a liberated camp, am I stunned, undone, incapable of moving on? Is it the sheer number of shoes in the pile? or the one on the top, exactly the size of my granddaughter's foot. Now, because that was a short poem, those of us who write short poems are allowed to possibly read a second poem. And my second poem um, is one that's gonna be coming out in my um, collection of Jewish po poetry this um, later this year called Kaddish, and the poem is called Unseeing. How to unsee the photograph. Three men, one playing accordion, eight smiling women in their uniforms taking a break. They pose, grin, hide the cigs. It was the 40s, you know. Made anecdotes about work. Who dropped dead in fright? How many they lost to starvation? The fourth often had a fell function. The photograph title laughing at Auschwitz while Anne Frank wastes away there, dreaming of writing, if only she had some paper, if only she had a pen, if only she had some time. So I am now to introduce the next poet, I'm looking forward to this, Leonore Weiss, um, she tutors middle grade uh, school and high school students in Oakland, California. Her poetry collections form a, tr a trilogy uh, of love, loss, being mortal. She also writes flash fiction, essays, and children's books. It's my kind of writer. Yours too, I'm sure. There. <laughs> Well, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. The first poem is the one published in the anthology and it's uh, entitled Discovering Hungarian at West End Mall. Up Radnoti Miklos Utka, street named after the Hungarian poet who died in labor camps months before liberation in a city that volunteered Jews to Nazi death, ancestral home to parents who squeezed their way past two world wars to meet in New York City's immigrant hothouse. I am looking to answer a question I have carried in a stone sack within me for years. Ransack a pastry shop and allow poppy seeds sugar and lemon peel to fill my mouth. And like a moth drawn to the lightest of things, move toward West End Mall's three floors of stores, sit next to a statuesque ice cream cone adorned with a red cherry, finish pastries and watch men and women belong to each other as I try to break the code of this strange language whispered in infant ears. Near the chain link bridge, I wear a badge of pure white, a strand that expanded to a telltale swatch, my grandmother Lenka's mark on me, not the yellow star pinned to a sleeve. She escaped and entered Ellis Island pregnant with my Aunt Clara, bastard child who revealed her secret on her deathbed. 
how Lanka was banned to the United States to give birth. Her sister's bindle tucked inside a sewing machine. Lanka's parents saved three lives, not their own. They say by the time she reached 30, her hair gleamed as white as enamel. And when she baked, she set out her cakes with cloth and napkins. I looked for her, my namesake, my missing chain link suspended over the Danube running down my spine. And when the pot-bellied waiter at the restaurant came to my side and winked twice, my mouth opened in Hungarian and he knew what I wanted. The second poem I am a, uh, will read is entitled Magic Penny and it's in the same vein. Magic Penny for my father. Hours on the beach he spent searching for pennies, dimes, quarters, for no other reason than to say, look what I found. And I could find a pretty penny too, if I kept my eyes open. We stood in a churn of clouds. I begged for him to tell me about his childhood, what his town was like, what his family was like, who his mother was, nothing except how his history began after he stepped off the boat. I'd heard about violets growing in the old country with petals as large as ears, about a wicked witch who pushed villagers inside a stone oven and let them burn. For years, I've searched for crumbs, never knew a scrap about those who came before, there had to be others who walked the shoreline of the ocean's mist. I wanted adhesiveness, a word that comes to mind, something that's hard to pull off without a bad ouch, to carry my father's strength forward like a magic penny. And next I have the pleasure of introducing Jacqueline Osterau, her most recent book is My Lookalike at the Krishna Temple, LSU Press, 2019. She's received Guggenheim, NEA, and Ingram Merrill Fellowships and the Witter Biner Prize. She's a distinguished professor at the University of Utah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I'll read my uh, poem in the book. Uh, it's a Misa of Rabbi Simcha Zeta, little Yiddish there. Misa, of course, is story, Zeta is grandfather. Uh, and this was a true story told to me by my friend Simcha. A Misa of Rabbi Simcha Zeta. My rabbi friend Zeta, Mer Chaim of blessed memory, sold candy from a push cart in 1920s, 30s Montreal, or rather meant to sell. He had a soft heart and the children in his neighborhood were poor. He bore on his cheek an enormous scar where a passing Cossack sword had hacked off his God-fearing beard and inadvertently saved his life since consequently, Chaim Meir fled his home and thereby missed his shtetl's conflagration. A bit like my great uncle who, thanks to Stalin, was safe in the gulag when the Einsatzgruppen came. Their procedure, to make the able body dig an enormous ditch, then shoot them into it. On top of them, less brawny family members. My friend, the rabbi, vividly remembers his mild mannered Zeta, meek, demure, watching boxing matches late into the night. To see one goy hit another, it gives me pleasure. To me, it's a deadly funny story. Blame my acrid Ashkenazic sense of humor. 
nursed on victimhood, catastrophe, lament. Not that I myself have earned its vantage point, my life amazingly unscathed by history, except as a terrifying rumor. Thus far, that is, let's not goad an already restless evil eye. Still, for me, a joke is tactic, analgesic, parable. Moisha and Yankel before a firing squad. How Moisha, for his last request, asks to smoke, and Yankel begs him, Moisha, don't make trouble. This too, I find eternally hilarious. But who's now left to get the punchline? Who's standing before a firing squad? And who, God help us, now holds the gun? And I'll read one more very short new poem. It's Shanghai Taxi. It's a villanelle. My daughter teaches us to recite a poem in Chinese, a poem all school children learn, Li Bai, bright moonlight, frost, missing home. It's for the teacher who taught her the poem. We practice in the taxi to the station. Everyone in China can recite this poem. Our driver, stunned, joins in, has us mimic him. Slowly, he exaggerates each tone. Bright moonlight, frost on the ground, missing home. He laughs and laughs, amused by our game. While I'm trying, impossible, to imagine all my countrymen united by a poem. Though once a cab driver recited Omar Khayyam all the way from the Salt Lake Airport in Persian when I told him what I do, he missed home. And my father-in-law could reel off every psalm in Hebrew, a brief shtetl education. The sun will not smite or the moon, help will come. How can we sing God's song away from home? Now it's my pleasure to introduce the poet and translator Dennis Maloney. His recent collections include The Things I Notice Now and The Faces of Guan Yin. He's also the editor, publisher of the wonderful White Pine Press in Buffalo, New York. Thank you for all that. Can you hear me? Good. It's, I'm still learning this vocabulary. Zoom. Okay, the, the poem in the anthology is this, and I'll read uh, three poems. In the capital and squares of Europe, people gathered to support Fan Gun Lei, refugees from Syria, and victims of genocide in Armenia. In the Brandenburg Gate, they celebrate the win World Cup win. I hear the very rare, rare chant of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, almost an insect species in America. In the dark shadows, the knights of broken glass return, emerging as their persecutors are confused with a piece of courtours and march in rallies against the all everything all night long, the foreign stream coming in the night. And the uh, second poem. This comes out of, uh, so I'm conflicted. I'm not going, I'm, well, I am going, but I'm not. But I'm always looking at the Jewish state versus the Palestinian Israel issue. So some of it's caught up in that. In the word laundry, new vocabulary no longer describes but conceals the slow corruption of language. The incendiary explosion of voices dehumanizes with hateful words. The onslaught is disinformation. In the word laundry, military campaigns are named after nature. Like strong cliff. No one is responsible for the earthquake, the tsunami. And what else I'll read. And these all come out of a experience in Europe uh, like four or five years ago of refugees, uh, both the Jewish Palestinian city, but all the Syrian refugees moving into Europe at the time. Uh, a dictionary explodes, sending words fleeing towards the borders. 
chased by those who are without name towards a greater unknown destination. Words are re refugees smuggled in hidden train compartments, walking on obscure paths through farm fields, forests, washing up debt on the shores, lost at sea, crawling under fences and over walls bordered to keep them out. Words are on a clandestine voyage, seeking asylum in an unknown language, their passports thick from collecting centuries of official stamps. One can't overestimate the amount of accumulated baggage. Thank you. I think you're going to introduce the next poet. I think you're muted. I think you can unmute. Yep, unmuted. Yes. Jen Laden is an author of nine books of poetry, including The Future is Trying to Tell Us Something New and Selected Poems. Your show now. Joy, you have to unmute, please. You'd think I'd know that by now. Um, thank you. One of the things that I love about being a Jewish poet is being Jewish gives you a pretty long view of human history. Um, even though I have not had a particularly long lifespan so far, this poem is an attempt to make use of that. It's called A Modest Proposal. Let's not kill or die today. Let's make angels out of yarn, men of snow, mashed potato animals that smile as we spoon their eyes of melted butter. Instead of killing ourselves or one another, let's neatly stack anxiety sweaters and scratch our itchy trigger fingers by whittling turtles for our mothers or pretending to understand Heidegger or imagining the sexual embrace through which time and space first conceived of matter. If we still aren't over killing and dying, we can search the stacks for library books that haven't circulated in generations and savor the mold that spores their spines the way wine snobs savor the nose of vintage wines bottled between wars to end all wars. Look, We've played all day and haven't spilled a drop of blood apart from the occasional paper cut. In an hour or two, when it's very dark, let's make up stories out of stars and fill them with all the killing and dying we didn't do today, except in our imagination. Let's pull our comforters over our heads and sing ourselves to sleep like good little civilizations. Um, I'd like to read a poem from a book in progress called Shekhinah Speaks. Um, the poem is written in the voice of the Shekhinah, who in Jewish mysticism is the female aspect of God. And uh, it's addressed to a human you. It's an individual you, but to the Shekhinah, we all seem pretty much alike. So um, this is called Your Body. And here is what you keep trying to escape the body I love, the blazing crush of physicality, impurity, and shame separating you from yourself, from your soul, from me, is the body I formed in your mother's womb, delivered, dandled, nursed, and comforted. The body that fails you in so many ways through which you struggle to materialize the way tomorrow struggles to materialize through today, blessing through pain, love through dread and loneliness, is flesh I made to be a place where you and I can rest, hang out, go crazy for one another, marry, say goodbye, apologize, have sex, consume, burn like incense, blaze, proclaim, plead and pledge, be held, protected, given and accepted born and born again. It's me you feel moving inside you, my presence that's so hard to reconcile with your sexual nature and the nature of sex that sometimes you feel violated, 
devoured. Tell yourself you're no good. Do years of therapy. Imagine gospels of fire, gospels of bone, gospels of coming to an end. I didn't make you to end. I made you a whirlwind of ways of being I never stop wanting. Ceremony and sacrifice, wine and reckoning, comedy, coolness, birthing and healing, falling in love, romance, yes, and sex. Your body is not damnation. Your body is a stream from which I drink, a hand I hold, a nipple I lick, a story I tell over and over, a Sabbath I keep for pleasure, a way of being alone, a way of being together, a choir of brokenness and lack, my throne, my glory, my crazy music, my dog-eared paperback. Thank you, uh, and I'd like to now introduce Zilka Joseph. Her work has appeared in Poetry and Poetry Daily. Her book, Sharp Blue, Search of Flame, from Wayne State University Press, was a Forward Indies Award finalist. She teaches creative writing. Hello, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here with all of you. I just want to say a quick uh, thank you to Nancy and to Matthew and to JCC for hosting this uh, wonderful uh, gathering of poets. Uh, I'm first going to read a poem from my book of poems called Sharp Blue Search of Flame. And the poem is called Bird in a Blizzard. Bird in a Blizzard. This is when you know you should have stayed home. This is when you know this is not your element. When you know you have been blown way off course, that water changes its face every day and the faces you love blur in that churning. That the whispers in the thick flood of flakes come from elsewhere. That the ones who gave you shelter are gone. That the cracking of the spine of the frozen river will be the last sound you will hear. And the thump, thump, thump you hear in your head is someone trapped inside your heart. Yes, this is when you know your ancestors are wanderers singing tunes you never knew you knew. Yes, this is when you know you remember every word of the song that the wind rips apart and flings, but how quickly your throat fills with snow. And when you turn again, you shiver as if you are wingless. You can move in only one direction now, deeper. Thank you. Uh, and the poem I'm going to read uh, next is from this beautiful, beautiful book put together by all of you. Uh, and it's called Sweet Malida. Malida is a, a very common um, sweet uh, preparation made by the Ben Israel community. I come from the Ben Israel community in India. Uh, and this was uh, particularly used um, when we broke the fast especially for Yom Kippur, but it was also used sometimes at Shabbat and uh, sometimes for a ceremony called Ilyohu Hanabi, which is a Thanksgiving sort of ceremony. Sweet Malida. A mix of water softened flattened rice, sugar, dried fruits and nuts was a dish made for Shabbat or for breaking fasts. Cooling light on the palate, and to the body and the spirit. It was welcome in the heat of day or night. We, like our Muslim, Christian, and Hindu neighbors and friends, had many foods in common. And we often celebrated together their festivals or ours. I relished particularly fresh coconut, the regional staple, its milk or its flesh, added to almost every dish. But this was to me the best way to eat it, 
finely grated by my mother's hands, left unsweetened and sprinkled haphazardly on the malida, juicy threads with a fleck of stubborn brown kernel here and there that sometimes crunched in your teeth like sand. And you winced and you swallowed it, knowing there was no simpler or purer or truer form than that. Thank you. And I'm going to introduce the next speaker, the next uh, poet. I have the great honor of introducing Jane Hirschfield. Jane Hirschfield's most recent book is Ledger, Knopf 2020. A former chancellor of the Academy of American Poets, she was elected into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2019. Welcome, Jane. Thank you so much. Um, this is just a magnificent reading. Thank you all. I'm going to begin with the poem from the anthology. It's got two slightly less familiar words in it. Mesozoic is simply the current biological era. And Archelon Ischyros is a very large sea turtle now extinct. My confession. A mortal soul, I did not believe in you. Against the age's preference, I wanted for your markings and history, the markings and history of, say, a small zebra, slightly implausible, far from unique, one visible pelt meant to disappear into the crowded many, one dark stripe alive among the crowded many. You seem to want to go on separately, you seem to want elsewhere and more. I wanted less. One moment to pause while setting kibble out in a dish for the calico cat who might or might not be inside the box when it finally opens. One goldfinch holding the whole Mesozoic discovery, hunting for seeds and hungry, escaping a few moments longer, the cat also hungry. This dilemma cannot be solved and will be. My immortal soul, perhaps you went into an Archelon Ischyros, swimming with its sea turtle nose above water, then diving. Immortal soul, had you existed, what more than that cold water could we have wanted? And for the second poem, um, both are in ledger. Uh, this one is titled Vest. I put on again the vest of many pockets. It is easy to forget which holds the reading glasses, which the small pen, which the house keys, the compass and whistle, the passport. To forget at last for weeks even the pocket holding the day of digging a place for my sister's ashes, the one holding the day where someone will soon enough put my own. To misplace the pocket of touching the walls at Auschwitz would seem impossible. It is not. To misplace for a decade the pocket of tears. I rummage and rummage Transfers for Munich, for Melbourne, to Oslo. A receipt for a Singapore copy. A device holding music. Bach, Garcia, Richter, Porter, Pert. A woman long dead now gave me, when I told her I could not sing, a kazoo, now in a pocket. Somewhere a pocket holding a Steinway. Somewhere a pocket holding a packet of salt. Borgesian vest, Oxford English dictionary vest with a magnifying glass tucked inside one snap closed pocket, Wikipedia vest, Rosetta vest, Enigma vest of decoding. How is it one person can carry your weight for a lifetime? One person slip into your open arms for a lifetime. Who was given the world and hunted for tissues, for chapstick. 
So our next reader will be Andrew Field, who is a teacher, writer, and musician. He had a chapbook of poems published in 2016 and is working now on a novel and an album of music. All right. Uh, it's been really great to hear the reading so far. Thanks to Nancy and Matthew for including my poem and all the other great poems. And thanks to the Buffalo JCC for having this, hosting this reading. It's been really great so far. Um, so I'm gonna read the poem in this book. It's a good book. <laughs> and then I'll read uh, some poems that I'm working on for a new chapbook. book. Um, so this is called The House of Rashi's Mind. And um, yeah, hope you like it. <clears throat> a word, a single word, the sound of it, and through the sound, bleeding through it, the multifaceted meanings. These things explode softly in Rashi's mind, wherein contains whole landscapes of language. Orchard, oops. Landscapes, orchards of meaning, meadows of letters, all waiting for the light of Rashi's mind to illuminate each pear tree, each flower. He would read a sentence, but what he sees beneath the words are worlds, the whole ocean, but also the color of the light falling on the water on a particular day. Like a painter, he could recall each color in his memory, each figure, each drama, and then evaluate a portion here, there, and make the whole thing cohere. This memory is like an enormous house with each room lit by a thousand candles. Entering the house, we are aware of a book turned into a starry sky, which Rashi uses as a compass to navigate the bewildering world. And then I'm going to read, I don't know, I'm a little, like, I have a, a chapbook that has some um, sort of monologues spoken by people and objects from my past, and I'm calling them like sort of duets. Um, and I'll just read a, a one or two. Um, this one's called Purim Teddy Bear Reveals All. And it's about a, a teddy bear that I won when I was a kid at a Purim fair. Um, so it's called Purim Teddy Bear Reveals All. They left me in a hotel room in Flagstaff. Then a man called and they sent me back to Bloomfield in a box. Do you know how many times that kid squeezed me? I've got stuffing coming out of my neck. No iron can smooth my crumpled floral shirt. My bottom has no trousers and a squint has replaced my sunny shine. They won me at a carnival it was either me or a goldfish swimming in a bag. Sometimes a kid thought he was a changeling, orphaned by Ganifs. He'd look at me, hug me. One night he saw a scary movie. I couldn't breathe. Imagine being ladled with such high expectations, needs. But he saw something in me understandable. A boy's bear is like a dog when there's no dog around and easier to care for. Um, and I think I'll just do one more. Um, here's um, This one's called um, Great Grandfather Meyer Makes an Argument. And it's sort of my great grandfather sort of imagining what he would say. Um, so he says, boy chick, I've sauntered too in shiftless buildings, massaging my forearms on the quilt. Rangy, hungry, vulpine, all of the above. I'm talking about life, the hard to see costume changes, the excess fat wrung out over time in exchange for a handkerchief, sharp suit, shoe shine, pin on your lapel from the place that salaries you or the delicatessen variety of my wife's hot breath when we kissed in the morning for 60 odd years. A person is worth more than all the money in the world, 
but there's still change. When that peters out, kaput, we should not stall any horse races or act as if learning were a four letter word. When I was here, I lived, loved, cried. Now you remember me what? When you look at a wallet, vase mirror. <laughs> All right, and uh, let me introduce um, Dina Ellenbogen is author of the poetry collection, Apples of the Earth and the memoir, Drawn from Water, an American poet, an Ethiopian family, an Israeli story. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Nancy Naomi and Matthew and Philip and Baruch and the JCC for putting together this wonderful program. It's been just wonderful hearing everybody's poetry so far. I'm gonna read my poem from the anthology um, and it's called A Voice and it's a pantoum, a repetitive form where the second and fourth line of one stanza become the first and third of the next and the first line becomes the last slightly altered. A voice. In the beginning, a whimper, pounding of heart steps, whispers of open fists, prayer notes in stone. Pounding of heart steps, chirps of morning songs, prayer notes in stone. The language of angels, chirps of morning songs. A girl stands at the threshold, hears the language of angels, her own music breaking. A girl woman stands at the threshold, chants the first words of Torah, her own voice breaking into stones with burning names. When a woman chants the first words, she finds inside her own voice stones with burning names. A cry becomes a scream. She finds inside her own voice a silence, a sigh, an exultation. A cry becomes a scream, a song of abundance a silence, a sigh, an exaltation. When a woman reaches the highest note in her abundant song, even the stones begin to tremble. The next poem I'm gonna read is slightly longer and it's a more recent poem called Extreme Weather. And it begins with an epigraph by the poet Alberto Rios that reads, the border says stop to the wind but the wind speaks another language and keeps going. They removed the fence that separates waves from people walking. There's nothing between us and water turning like oceans of larger coasts. The day we didn't dig my uncle's grave, a derecho swept the shores of Lake Michigan, uprooted ancient maples, American ash. We ran against the darkening sky, sheltered indoors and watched from a safe distance. His ashes danced the rhythms of distant waters. They call it erosion when waves take more than they give back, swallow the sand beneath our feet. If you walk away from the lake towards the shadows of hundred year old homes, you'll see ladders still leaning towards the roofs that failed when hail bombarded us in April, the night before the holiday of plagues. We tried to collect ourselves in the shards that landed in our gardens, hands still raw from March winds, we planted against tyranny and later gathered zucchini, tomatoes and basil. There were seeds that promised to sprout, but lay dormant. We watered throughout July's drought, nodded at neighbors through cloth, masks, and gloved knuckles. We kept turning the earth, planting milkweed next to dreams of an ordinary life. It's autumn and time to remove the tangled roots of what no longer bears fears. I had meant to write fruit, what no longer bears fruit, but fear accompanies every gesture. I'm writing to tell you that skies change suddenly, roots that seem deep can be lifted by November wind. Listen closely, nearby is the water we call life. 
I'm now pleased to introduce our next poet, um, Lau Cesarco Eglin. She's a poet and translator. Her latest collection is Life, One Not Attached to Conditionals. She's the translator of Hilda Hilst's Of Death, Minimal Odes, a 2019 BTBA winner. She's the publisher of Valise Books. Lau. Thank you, Dina. Um, I'm going to be reading with uh, the translator of the poems, the poem in the book, and also the other poem that we'll be reading. His name is Scott Spambauer, and Scott has published a two translations, and these include, and well, these are Adolfo Pardo's The Grill and my book Calling Water by Its Name. He teaches at University of Colorado Boulder. So the first book, the first poem that we'll be reading uh, is in the book and I'll be reading the Spanish version and Scott will be reading his wonderful translation. Ya está. Si le saco el tilde al cáncer, empujo el énfasis hacia la salida. Intento decirle que esta no es su terminal. Pero sé que de grave agudo el dolor viene a señalar que está ahí la palabra. ¿Qué acento tiene? ¿En qué idioma duele menos? A los 30, la historia pesa más en mi cuerpo, tu cáncer cuenta, el tuyo, el de ella, el de él, en mí, la familia, bien marcada. Una mamografía, un ultrasound, después de palpar un nódulo, hacen todo más real. En la cara me lo dicen, cáncer. Me aprendo el significado para no tener miedo al decirlo, con todas las letras. El término en mi boca, no termina con mis palabras. Estiro la boca horizontal y se opera el cáncer en Estados Unidos. Incluyo en la nariz en estos crecimientos y digo cáncer. O toco tu sartán en la memoria, esperando ahuyentarlo con la lengua, escupirlo en mi superstición. Mi cuerpo, mío, lo hablo, lo digo, acá soy, acá no termina. That's it. If I take the accent off of cáncer, I shift the emphasis toward its exit. I try to tell her that this is not the end of the line, but I know that from serious to severe, the pain comes to point out that it's there. The word, what accent does it have? In which language does it hurt less? At 30, history is heavier in your cancer in my body and yours and hers and his tell in me. The family is clearly marked a mammogram, an ultrasound, after palpating a nodule makes everything more real. They tell me to my face, cancer. I learned right away what it, mean, what it meant so I wouldn't be afraid to say it with all its letters. The expression in my mouth exceeds my mere words. I stretch my mouth horizontally and the cancer is operated on in the United States. I include my nose in those growths and I say cancer, or I touch your sartan in my memory, hoping to dispel it with my tongue, spit it out, out of superstition, my body, mine. I speak it, I say it, I'm here. It doesn't end here. Both of the poems that we're reading are from this book, Castredia, Taylor Shop. And this is our last poem. Hoy te digo, cosas que ese lunes no te dije, porque pensé que tenía que llover con piedad para que el martes estornude sin taparse la boca. Prefiero caminar por calles planas. Así no pienso en los pasos, uno a uno. Te mandaría a freír papas, pero sé lo del colesterol. No quiero meterme donde los colores destiñen. Abanico el, el calor para tentar al otoño y que se caigan las hojas como si yo no hubiera tenido nada que ver. No quiero disfrazarme, porque me lo creo. El libro tiene 80 hojas, porque las conté. Hay pantalones que lastiman la piel, cordón, cordón, cordón. Me gusta la palabra imprescindible, la inventé, hasta que me di cuenta que no. Today I tell you, things I didn't tell you that Monday, because I thought it had to rain mercifully for Tuesday to sneeze without covering its mouth. 
I prefer to walk flat streets. That way I don't think about the steps one by one. I would tell you to get lost, but I know you'd find a map. I don't want to go where colors fade. I fan the heat to tempt autumn all as if I had nothing to do with it. I don't want to dress up because I'll think that's who I am. The book has 80 pages because I counted them. There are pants that hurt your skin. Shoelace, 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 I like it. The word essential, I made it up until I realized that I didn't. This concludes the reading portion of our event. Now we will have a Q&A. Thank you, each po I'd like to thank each poet for, do, for giving us their, their best. I really enjoyed it. Um, I, uh, and I'm sure all of you did. Now we're in the Q&A portion and I hope that you are writing your, your questions in on the YouTube channel. We've got a few to start us off with. And I think um, one of them is, what do we mean by a Jewish poem? What is a Jewish poem? So, Jane, yes, would you like to start us off? I would if I could unmute. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the only answer to that is, what isn't a Jewish poem? <laughs> Um, anything that, that Jews think, other people think. Anything that Jews celebrate is celebrated maybe a little differently somewhere else. But what is a poem is what tells us who we are, who the poet is, and the people who love that poem, who they are. And I think that's very Jewish. And do you want to jump in, anybody? Um, I, oh, can I say something? Please. Um, I think it's like one of those questions that obviously doesn't have like a, you know, simple answer. Um, <laughs> it's like sometimes people try to answer it sort of thematically, um, sort of along the lines of the anthology, like sort of, you know, drawing upon poems that have like Jewish content, you know? Um, it seems like, in, at least in terms of Jewish American poetry, like there's definitely traditions of Jewish American poets, right? Like there's like the Stein, Gertrude Stein, you know, going to like the language poets, right? You know, like the, the Jewish language poets, like there's quite a rich tradition of Jewish Americans writing language poetry, right? like Charles Bernstein and all those people. Um, there's also like other traditions though that don't get as much attention. Um, uh, Harold Bloom wrote this fascinating article in the seventies um, it was published in commentary and was about sort of Jewish American poets that he was sort of interested in. I, I'm a big fan of Bloom, even though he sort of gets a bad rap nowadays. Um, but he made a fascinating argument, which I don't really want to go into now because you guys can just read it. But he mentioned lots of Jewish American poets that no one reads anymore. And when I, when I read them, I'm oftentimes I'm quite moved. Um, poets like um, John Hollander, uh, Alvin Feynman, Alan Grossman, who also wrote amazing criticism. Um, he mentions lots of men. That's probably like the weakness of his argument. Um, but the men he mentions, at least I find to be quite moving Jewish American poets. Like, and no one writes about them anymore. It makes me sad. Um, but I mean, there is like a sort of fascinating tradition of Jewish American poet poetry in this country. Um, you know, but anyways, yeah. Thank you. Someone else? So I'll jump in since I'm not American. Uh, I do have to say that a, a Jewish poem, I wouldn't want to flatten it, this definition with a, something narrow, right? Uh, being Jewish uh, or writing about a Jewish theme is uh, one side of a complex uh, entity, which is identity, right? And um, it might be, one of our strands of identity, but we can never separate these strands. So when we write, we write as, you know, the compound complex uh, creatures that we are. 
Um, I, I definitely don't think that there is one unique uh, way of being a, a Jewish or of writing a Jewish poem, whatever that means. <laughs> uh, and I, I certainly advocate for not finding that one definition and, and keeping it broad because we are all different. And in a, that, that is the, the beauty of it, the richness. Thank you. And, and Phil, you have this series with Baruch of Jewish poetry. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, like, like most Jews, um, we're ambivalent about everything, you know. So we can argue either way and believe it. Um, but it seems to me if you're calling a poem a Jewish poem, that means that there's a non-Jewish poem. There's, there's boundaries. And we're all kind of, uh, I, I'm suspicious of boundaries too, as poets. You know, poetry doesn't like to have boundaries. Yet we're putting a boundary by saying these are, this is a Jewish poem. Uh, but maybe there are Jewish elements within a lot of poems that may have other elements. I think maybe Lao, maybe, maybe you're talking about that. I'm, I may be wrong. But, you know, it's not just, a, you, you know, you can argue, yeah, well, there's a Jewish element in here, but there's also other elements in here as well. And it doesn't have to just remain one kind of poem. But I do think that if you're, if you're saying uh, there's a Jewish poet, there's some element of, of Judaism uh, and Jewishness within that poem. And uh, often it's in content, I think, um, and, uh, and uh, uh, is inspired by the tradition, uh, which is 5,000 years old, uh, and has some elements of the Jewish uh, experience or history or culture or something that makes it, uh, you can say about it is something Jewish about it. But that's broad, because as one, somebody said, uh, Judaism is a broad spectrum, there's a lot a lot of elements there, but but there's certainly there's some something that other people can identify and connect with uh, that's Jewish. And then I think there's also the aspect of questioning that is something that Jews do. I think that like if you look at like the Passover Seder, you have the questions, and that is an identity that is part of identity, asking questions about the world. And it's a philosophical thing, an ideological thing. It's not just a matter of saying this person or this poetry is, 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 has Jewish themes in it. It's what it does philosophically that you could say makes it Jewish. Just as you might argue that Franz Kafka is a Jewish writer, although he doesn't write really about being Jewish. It's the act of questioning and the act of creating the, the metaphor or creating the, the world that that is Jewish, because it, um, you know, according to uh, the Kabbalah, the God looked into the Torah and created the world, and it's the Jews' responsibility to mimic God, at least according to the Torah. Like the Jew is supposed to be committed, is supposed to be created in God's image, and to to sort of ascertain and and, and achieve that level. So in, in doing that, um, in, in doing that, the Jew, in, in writing, the Jew creates the world or anyone who writes, you could say, creates the world, all people who write. So I would almost say that writing is a Jewish act and all writers, in a sense, are doing something that is something that Jews do. Who said all poets are Jews? <laughs> But also, if we want to get it like a little bit less so broad that it has no definition at all, <laughs> um, some people say that like Kafka and Roth are Jewish writers because they wrote about parents and children, you know, and people say, you know, other writers like Malamud for, you know, like, or Bello, they say he wasn't, he wasn't as much of a Jewish writer because he didn't really write about parents and children so much. And I think I like that definition because like, if you read like the Torah or like the, the stories, you know, like the stories that moved me personally, the most of the stories about parents and children. And that's something that the New Testament doesn't really have. Right. So it's like what, you know, that's I, th I find that definition compelling. It's like, well, what makes a Jewish. A, it's not really a Jewish poem, but what makes a Jewish writer a Jewish writer? You know, it's like they write about parents and children. 
I like one. that. I like that. But I think that that that's for me. That's like too. That's too limiting. I really like what you're saying, though. Jacqueline and then Lenore. Unmute. Oh no! I was just answering Phil. It's Tvetsayeva who said all poets. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> that's all. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll I'll, ans I'll answer that question in my own way. Um, you know, I've I th I think that um, I remember I was going to synagogue uh, one evening with a friend, and this was an Orthodox synagogue. And I'm not an or you know I'm not an Orthodox Jew, but she really was excited for me to come to services and and to experience that. And she said to me, and I was very moved, she said to me, Lenore, you know, when I enter the synagogue, I feel like I'm connecting to a root that goes back ages. And, and it just, uh, it fills me. Uh, and I think when I, when I am writing um, poetry along Jewish themes, I know I am searching for my Jewish roots because I um, didn't grow up in a uh, very religious household. I think my parents were reacting like many of their generation against things Jewish. So it's really as an adult that I have, um, I, I continue turning over those stones and learning more. So for me, it's, um, it's embracing that root that goes back thousands and thousands of years and being immersed in it. And we have such a amazing, rich culture and history. And, you know, the, the word is very present in, in, the, in, in Judaism. Uh, it's almost, it's like uh, the, wor the world was created with, with the word. So, um, but I, I think it's it's just uh, there is of course you know as we're all speaking there is no one particular um, definition. Uh, it's a it's a tradition that we all share I think and we approach it in different in different ways based on who we are who each one of us are what we're bringing to that tradition and some of us bring a lot of. A lot of us bring Hebrew <laughs> and an understanding of, of that part of the tradition, which I, I think is wonderful. So that's, that's me, that's it. Thank you. Any other comments on that question? It looks like we have a question for the editors. How did the editors come up with a specific number of 101. Matthew? We can't hear you. Still? One's not working. It shows that your mic is now it's now it's off. But I mean your mic is on, but we can't hear. Oh, he doesn't know what to say. <laughs> maybe Nancy, you uh as an editor, maybe you might want to take that. So we we didn't have a number to start with. We, we just put out the call. And then when we, we saw the poems that were coming in, we then started thinking, would we accept a bunch of poems from fewer poets or more poets and one poem a piece? And that became a, a question that um, I think I don't know how we finally decided what to do, but it just seemed like we couldn't turn away so many different um, expressions of the, the Jewish experience. And so we said, okay, one, one poem per person. 
And then we looked at the numbers and we thought, you know, I, I bet we could have a hundred of them. And then it, it turned out we easily had a hundred. And then there was this miscounting things that go on with um, a poem that was going to be there or not. I can't remember what it was. And then one of us said, well, let's just make it 101. And um, I think Jen said, that sounds even better than, than 100. It's got a, a good flair to it. And then we ended up with our, our 101. Jen, did you want to add anything to that? I, I, I think you represented that well. <laughs> yeah, the, the 101, it just sounded um, catchy and is more memorable. And since you're playing there with um, numbers anyways, you know, the third millennium, grabbing uh, the reader's attention with the 101, I think was the, the best way to go. And I think it's a perfect number. Mm -hmm. And it looks like there's a question for Andrew. And it is, can you speak about what inspired your Rashi poem or share any background on the piece? Yeah, um, thank you for asking that question. I wish I could see you. I, I don't see the people in the audience, obviously, but um, that poem was written for, um, I was living in Cleveland then, and I was, uh, yeah, and I participated in something called the Jewish Arts and Culture Lab. Um, which was a wonderful program. I don't know if it's still in existence um, for various reasons, but it was great. We got together, it was like sort of Jewish visual artists, Jewish poets, um, and we had a really great teacher. Uh, her name's Alana Cooper, I believe, and she, and another woman too that was great. She was a dancer. And um, we sort of studied together. They gave us lots of good Jewish texts. Um, and the woman, Alana, who was, was sort of main teacher, at one, one day during a class, she was like, how would you visualize the house of Rashi's mind? And I was like, that totally sounds like the title of a poem. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was like, let me see if I can come up with some images for that sort of idea, you know. Thanks. Thank you. It looks like those are the questions that we've gotten from the audience. And readers, do you have any other question you want to bring up to any of the other readers? Looks like we're good. So I will thank the readers for really a breathtaking reading. Um, wonderful to hear and echo all the thanks that Matthew has shared and to the audience and to the JCC in Buffalo and Phil and Baruch and also to Katie Zontek and Patricia Quinn who have made it technologically speaking possible for us. And I'll turn over the, the program back to Phil and Baruch. Baruch, you wanted to, you wanna, who's coming in March? Now, we wanted to talk a little bit about a future of our future poetry readings, uh, poetry yep. series. Yeah, on March 15th at 7 o'clock, don't miss it, David Kaplan, um, Charlene Fix, and Julia Nabok will be reading. Three great poets. Yes, in April, we have three more great poets. Uh, Neil Sil Silverblatt, Linda Paston, and the famous Baruch November. And that's in April 26th and May 24th, uh, Bob Dylan's 80th birthday, by the way, Jake Marmer, Norman Finkelstein, Norman Finkelstein and Erica Meitner. We're looking forward to all of those. Please come and join us and um, sh share more Jewish poetry as we go through the winter into the spring, by which time the world is gonna be a much better place, right? <laughs> With more Jewish poetry in it. Thank you so much, everybody. You're just so fantastic. Nancy, Matt, uh, thank you so much for editing this. Um, um, Jennifer, for, for helping to publish it and putting it to the world. Um, just a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll hear you all again, <laughs> I'm sure. So uh, thanks. And Katie and Patricia, thanks again. Um, and I think that pretty much does it, doesn't it, Baruch? Yes, I wish you all of you well. Um, I wish you uh, uh, 
uh, healthy, healthy days and great nights. And happy Purim, right? And, and you can catch Purim. this on YouTube, by the way. So uh, if you have any questions about how to do that, um, email Katie. <laughs> she'll, she'll tell you. Or any of us, uh, Baruch or myself. We'll be sharing it on Facebook, too. Yeah. So you'll get to hear this all again and share it with everybody you know. Take care. Good night. Good night.